You're in the future, when all of a sudden you look down and you see an old Laserdisc turtle. The Laserdisc turtle lays on its back, its bits rotting, beating its legs trying to get preserved. But it can't. Not without your help. But you're not helping. Why is that? In my last video, we looked at how you can create essentially perfect captures of Laserdiscs using a Doomsday Duplicator. But just getting the capture is only the first step. After that, you need to process it into something usable using the LDD code software package, which has many parts that all require some understanding to use and can be different based on the features your disk has. Today, we're going to be taking a very technically dense look into the entire process of using LDD code to create usable video files from Laserdisc captures. This is a mixture of a sort of guide to help you get started on this yourself, as well as a summary of things I've encountered as I've started on this process. Hopefully this will give you a more complete understanding of how all this works. If you didn't watch the first video, you should go back and do that, because we're about to hit the ground running. LDD code is a suite of tools for taking LDS files created by the Doomsday Duplicator or HCX card, which I didn't mention last time, but is worth looking into, and eventually converting them into a watchable video. This is where the bulk of my time has been spent on figuring out how to best preserve Laserdiscs due to the many different kinds there are. I've taken a lot of what I've learned about this and put it in a readme and some scripts in a GitHub repo, I'll link in the video description. The first step you need to do is to decode the raw analog data into something usable. The main LDD code program is what does this. It will extract the audio into raw 16-bit little Indian PCM data, the video into a very big custom TBC file, and extract the EFM digital data if your disk has it. The digital data was a feature added later, below the analog channels in the RF spectrum, that usually has digital CD quality sound encoded in it, much like how digital computer games could be stored on an audio cassette. There's going to be a lot more analog-digital hybrid stuff going on here, so keep that in mind when working on Laserdiscs. A JSON file is also created that contains some information about the decoded disk, as well as some digital information that is contained in the vertical blank interval of the video itself. This area looks like a checkerboard pattern above the video when you see it. This is where things like subtitles, frame counters, and some other information get stored. Performing this decode to extract all these different elements of the signal is the longest part of this process. It takes an immense amount of CPU time, and while you can set it up to use multiple threads, from all my testing, any more than six is more likely to hurt than help. This takes hours to finish. I was looking at 8 to 16 hours for these to be done for CLVs, with an i9-11980HK being the fastest CPU I tested. Now because of the large commitment, before you fully run LDD code to convert an entire LDS file, I recommend you use the start and seek parameters with a length limit to find the sample point of the actual first frame of the video. As I mentioned in the last video, the Doomsday Duplicator can capture when video isn't shown by the player, and the automated capture process will always record the head moving from the middle of the disc to the start location of the first frame. This is normally hidden from the viewer because the player blinks the output until it finds the first frame, but because we're tapped straight into the signal, we capture it all. This needs to be skipped because it can cause issues with decoding, audio especially if you have it included. I also have an example of an extreme case with one of my RLVs that the player would normally fail to play. I physically held the transport at the end of the disc in a spot it could play and released it after it detected the different position on the disc. This let it move back to the start and play the whole disc, but with a large amount of bad capture included first. Using Seek and Skip will let you have a TBC that only has the intended program data. Seek tries to find a specific frame number by decoding the video data. It can move forwards and backwards in the frames to find it. The first frame starts with a 0 for a CLV and a 1 for CAV. Skip just moves through the file, approximately the number of bytes equal to that many frames. Seek usually can't work without skipping into the data at least a little, so both are usually needed. I created a preview script that passes these two values to this to quickly try to find the start of the intended disk content. Once you know the values to find the start point, you can let the full decode run. A minor note here that I'll come back to later, AC3 data is automatically decoded during this and must have a parameter passed to it. You also can't 
always enable it due to it generating a very large error log and slowing down the decode. But if you do a preview decode, like I described before, you can check if that AC3 file is non-zero in size to know if there is AC3 content without having to listen to it. The disc jackets are really bad about making it clear if they are AC3, so I tend to just do this test after the capture. After you've decoded the LDS file, you finally have something you can view, and the LD Analyze program can be used to check this TBC file. This program can show you many things. The video with and without color, graphs of the signal quality and dropouts, and some of the metadata embedded into the VBI. Now, most of the time, you'll likely be able to call your pre-processing work before creating a final video file done here. The final step for all of these disks involves using LD Chroma Decode to send the video frames to FFmpeg, but before you do that, you have some choices to make. If you step through the frames of the video, you will likely see some interlacing. Interlacing is a large topic uh, that I could go into, but at a basic level, it's essentially two half frames merged together sometimes. There were typically two ways this was done on Laserdisc. Either it alternates between interlaced and not interlaced, or it's continuously interlaced. This is dependent on whether or not the source material was intended to be 24-ish frames per second, like film, or 60-ish frames per second, like broadcasts. Interlacing worked fine on CRTs and you wouldn't really notice it, but on modern progressive displays, it can be quite distracting. If you want to attempt to fix it, you should really view every single TBC file before you decode it to see what interlacing methods were used. Annoyingly, I have encountered a growing number of disks where the types of interlacing were mixed, meaning you can't use one filter for the whole disk, and the only real choice you have to initially convert the file is without interlacing, and then fix each part manually later. I also have a PAL TV show converted to NTSC, which was then Telecine interlaced, which is basically impossible to repair. Even they didn't try to fix this in the remastered Blu-ray. Now the process of deinterlacing is not really part of the LDD code project because it's a common video issue not limited to Laserdiscs, but it can be done with FFmpeg when you're creating the final video file. The LDD code wiki goes over some of the common methods of how to do this for Laserdiscs. But no matter what video type you have though, you can use the LD Chroma decoder to read the TBC file and output it to something FFmpeg can read as a direct piped input. This will let you finally create a video file you can watch. But not here. Sound is a lot more complicated because it was one of the best features of Laserdisc and evolved a number of times. The most basic sound capability a Laserdisc can have is the analog audio track. These are decoded into the PCM file as 16-bit Little Indian alongside the TBC. If you specify the data format and include them with FFmpeg, you can add the sound to your video output. Professor, look! But most Laserdiscs also have a digital audio track stored in the EFM file. You can extract that audio using the LD Process EFM program. This will output the digital audio as another 16-bit PCM file. The digital audio is better, but you likely want to have both tracks included in your output. Some releases took advantage of the two audio tracks to do things like have different languages available. As another example, karaoke discs could have the music with and without lyrics on the different tracks. With FFmpeg input mapping, you can include both audio tracks and switch between them when watching your video file. But we're not done yet, because in addition to the common stereo sound, there were quite a lot of surround sound laser discs. I'm not talking about Dolby surround though. That one was kind of lame and you should probably just ignore it. The two real 5.1 surround formats were AC3 and DTS, both of which work completely differently. This is one of the areas where the Doomsday Duplicator is really awesome, because normally to hear these surround tracks, you would need dedicated decoding hardware that is becoming Quite expensive. AC3 replaces the right analog audio channel when it is used and needs to be decoded at the same time you create your TBC file, as I mentioned earlier. This means that discs with AC3 will have a total of three audio tracks, the AC3 surround, digital stereo, and the mono left analog channel. That lone analog track was sometimes used for director's commentary. That's right, Laserdisc had optional special features even without the fancy menus that DVD had. 
Now, DTS disks are a little easier to deal with and can be decoded with an argument for LD process EFM after making the TBC. Firstly, you'll be able to detect if a disk is DTS or not by the hole in your bank account. These were coming out towards the end of the format and are uncommon and very desirable. I had to buy one just to make this video because I'd never even seen one before. DTS is encoded in both channels of the digital audio track. So you only have surround and stereo analog channels on these. But man, uh, DTS does sound incredible. I don't have a direct comparison of the same source, but all of my other AC3 movies don't sound anywhere near as clear as this disc does. So to sum it all up, you can have LaserDisc sound with analog only, analog and digital, mono analog, stereo digital, and AC3 surround, and stereo analog with DTS surround. With FFmpeg, it's possible to have every combination of audio formats all combined into your final video files, but the argument incantations get pretty messy to do this, so I'm going to steer you towards my GitHub repo again for that. There's still more to do, and I want to move on, but I'll say it's also possible to have FFmpeg convert the AC3 and DTS tracks to PCM surround, which makes them a lot more compatible with other software, like DaVinci Resolve, if you want to do post-processing, like joining each side of a movie into a single file. Now I'm going to quickly cover two more things you could add to the video file with FFmpeg. Chapters and subtitles. LaserDiscs had chapters baked in, and you can use the LD Process VBI and LD Export metadata to export them into a format that FFmpeg can use to mark the file with. The chapters usually had names printed on the jacket, but they aren't embedded into the disc. If you want those, you have to edit the metadata file and manually type them in. Using the same tools, you can also extract subtitles from the discs that have them. That dual language disc, for example, had English subs, which could let you watch in Japanese with subs to know what's going on. The subtitle data can be a little hard to use though. Laser discs had so many features that sometimes they crept into other places. The subs are exported as an SCC format file, which I believe are a closed caption byte based format. And TT Convert is the only program I could find to convert these into something more standard, like SRT. LaserDisc used some non-standard codes for that format sometimes, though, which can cause TT Convert to error out. I've ended up modifying my local copy of it to ignore errors, which gets me some more valid subtitles, but it also produces a lot of garbage sometimes that I have to manually remove. It's possible that this is LDG, which is graphic data in the subtitle area, because LaserDisc just didn't have enough ways to store data. But with all of the audio tracks and this metadata, you can have a very feature-packed video file just from a decode of an old movie disc. At this point, you can now get all of the extracted features off of a LaserDisc and into FFmpeg. But I haven't really talked about what the video itself looks like. LaserDiscs were full resolution for their broadcast format counterparts, NTSC and PAL. That means that the video is roughly 500 pixels tall. However, it was almost always exclusively a 4x3 format, and widescreen movies would usually be letterboxed, meaning that they effectively only had 300 vertical pixels. This is a very low resolution. An extreme example here is Kirk riding a horse in Star Trek Generations. There is so little detail in his face, we can't really be sure if that's actually William Shatner. This is just how pre-HD media formats are, and this was the best you could get at the time. When it comes to encoding final video, I have several recommendations to make here, but none of them are going to be artificial detail enhancement. The low resolution is just part of the history of media. It shouldn't be fixed. However, I will recommend a scaling of sorts for your video file due to how modern video codecs work. You can use uncompressed video formats like the LD decode wiki mentions, but the previous files you've created for this process will always be superior to that, so you may as well accept the flexibility that common compressed codecs can give you, and I would recommend H.265 as a good option for this. This will cause a quality hit, but a big part of that is just because modern codecs aren't really designed for such low resolution media. The short version is that macro blocks are used to represent chunks of information covering multiple pixels. The lower resolution your source video file, the more information of what's happening in the scene will be crammed into a single macro block. There is an inherent balance between losing information, file size, and playback performance. Now, my solution to this may seem a little odd. 
I would recommend you pixel double your video. That is two times nearest neighbor scaling. Literally, all you're doing is making the vertical and horizontal resolution twice as big by copying pixels, but without a smoothing filter. Doing this reduces the macro block information density by one quarter and yields much better looking results. Seriously, the difference is massive. And in my limited testing, the file size is only increased by about one third as well because of how the variable macro block size of H.265 works. This FFmpeg line is all you need to do this. And as a bonus tip here, if you're doing traditional video capture of any low resolution source to a compressed format, use pixel doubling in your output file. It solves a lot of problems. Okay, that's finally almost everything you need to know when it comes to decoding and converting raw analog laser disc capture. Almost. There are a few alternate route things that I can't go without mentioning because they're just too cool. Remember what I said about dropouts on the discs in the last video? The data is just missing in those cases. There are, however, some options. First is LD dropout correct. This can take the data around the missing dropouts and try to fill it in. You can probably do this with every TBC file you read out to LD Chroma Decoder when making your final video file and have some pretty good results. On my horrible example of war games, it was able to clean up a good amount of the actual dropouts, but it can't really do anything about the static and the chroma damage. The data is just ruined. The only way you could do that is by replacing it, which you can do with LD Disk Stacker. This allows you to read multiple disks and create a merged TBC file of all of the best parts. This means you need multiple copies of a movie though, but that's not a problem. The first rule of government spending is why build one when you can have two at twice the price. Now, contact is listed on the LDDB as being a disc susceptible to rotting, but my copies actually look surprisingly good. They do have some problem areas though, if we look at the dropout graph, especially towards the end as there's something going on over and over again. But with two copies of the movie and so much time spent decoding, we can stack them to make that even better. With that, a lot of errors have been cleared up. Looking at the dropout graph, we can see a significant decrease from a max of 150 down to 30. I should note at this point that in order to do this, you have to run LD disk map to copy your file and align it correctly for the stacking method. So if you're keeping all of the files for every stage as you work on it, this uses a lot of storage to stack. It's really cool that you can do this to fix the disks, but it does leave me with one question. What if you had three copies of the movie? The dropout graph is significantly more cleaned up yet again. But what if you had four copies of the movie and the graph is just empty now? Is this a perfect capture? No. If you look closely, you'll see there are still artifacts where the dropouts were corrected. These are actually errors because that fourth disc was actually a different pressing and the frames don't line up the same as the others. It also turned out these three identical copies have some identical errors, which means there's an issue with the master copy of the movie. Not a lot you can do to fix that. Now I have to answer at least one question I know I'm going to get by going back to war games. What would happen if I stacked it against itself? After cleaning the disc, I captured the same section 10 times and stacked it. The results were technically better, but not enough to be worth the effort. There is a slight wobble to the disc and laser as it plays, which can come at the disc from a different angle, missing some of the causes of dropouts, but that's clearly the exception and not the rule. The stacking is a powerful process though, and it means there is a reason to continue archiving copies of disks, even if one is done already, because a better sum of their parts can be created. All right, that's finally all the pieces of the puzzle. This is a very complicated topic, so let's do a high level rundown of the whole thing one more time. After you get your LDS rip, you need to figure out where the disk starts and if it's AC3. Then you spend many hours decoding it into an intermediary TBC file and different audio formats plus metadata. Then you figure out and convert all your audio and metadata 
And finally, you decode your TBC into FFmpeg and merge all of your files into one. This is all just to do one side of one disk though. Personally, I'm going to be making M3U playlists, which are just a text file with a header and file names to merge video files. Concatting these files would not be easy with all of the audio tracks and metadata. It's possible, but the playlist is a lot easier. The same goes for splitting things. TV shows and other compilations on Laserdiscs could be split by chapter, but the timings may not align perfectly and can be odd sometimes. There are also, of course, edge cases, like this educational disc that one of my patrons has been working on that has stop commands baked into the VBI so you can step through still photos since it's CAV. This should be decoded into both video and images, and I'm still helping them figure out the easiest way to automate doing that without decoding all 54,000 frames into images just to call it down to a couple dozen. This whole process for Laserdiscs is complicated, very manual, and still evolving in some ways, but this is an incredible means to preserve a worthwhile format so it can continue to be usable in the future. There is also a community of people behind the hardware and software working to make sure notable titles like Laser Active Games are being preserved. If you want to get in touch with them to learn more about this or to get help archiving something, I'll leave a link to their Discord server in the description. Now that we've covered everything for Laserdiscs, I'll also mention this is all possible with VHS as well. And in the future, I will be revisiting this topic to take a look at that. But for now, that's it. I hope you all enjoyed this in-depth technical look at how to preserve Laserdiscs. And again, a special shout out to everyone behind the Doomsday Duplicator project because it's truly amazing. And being able to do this is kind of a dream come true. If you enjoyed this video, you may want to subscribe because this is far from the only preservation thing that I do. And if you want to help support the channel, you can find me on Patreon. But for now, that's it, and I will see you next time.